Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar and happy International Women's Day to you all. We are very excited to bring you today's webinar on embracing equity, valuing feminine power in the workplace with our wonderful speaker, Kate Gaffey. Kate has some brilliant content to share with you guys today, so I'll try not to delay too much in our introductions, but I know she has asked me to mention that she is really happy to take your comments and interaction in the chat box as we go throughout today, as well as if you have any questions, you can pop them into the Q&A section and I will be sure to pop back on near the end where we've left some time for Q&A with Kate as well. Just to introduce myself, my name is Francesca and I work in the Thrive Wellbeing Hub and CA Support. We always like to take the opportunity at an event such as today, just to mention that if there is anybody joining us in attendance who may be having some difficulties or going through a hard time, that you remember that there are really good supports and services available from the Thrive Wellbeing Hub and indeed in the wider institute here. So I will pop uh, during the, uh, webinar, I will pop the contact details for the Thrive Wellbeing Hub and our confidential services into the chat box so you have the details there. There has been a few contributors that have made today possible um, and very much the support of my own colleagues as well in the Institute, some of whom have gathered together to really make an event of today and watch this together. So welcome to you all as well. But today is brought to you and made possible by the support of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, the Thrive Wellbeing Hub, the Member Experience Team and the Young Professional Committee as well, one of whom Claire Doyle is actually joining us to host today as well. So I would be very happy to pass over to Claire, who is going to talk to a little bit more about the work of the Young Professionals Committee and introduce our speaker today as well. So over to you, Claire. Thank you. Thanks, Francesca. I am delighted to be here today representing the Young Professionals Committee. Um, the Young Professionals range from newly qualified chartered accountants up to 40 years of age. So that's really a huge demographic for us. And what we do is we host a range of events throughout the year, including CPDs, socials, get togethers and events just like today. Our theme for this year has been about collaborating with others, and we've been delighted to collaborate with the Thrive Wellbeing to co-host this fantastic session on International Women's Day. I'm not here on my own today. I'm delighted to have Kate Gaffey as well with us. Kate is the founder of Workplace, Wellbe Workplace, Workplace Wellness sorry, and has been providing corporate wellbeing services to organisations since 2014. Kate started out like many of us in finance and worked in a busy stockbrokers in Dublin and was very fast paced, pressurized and frantic way of life. And she really wanted to slow down and to follow her dreams. And this will resonate with so many of us in the audience today who really burned the candle at both ends and said enough is enough. Workplace wellness was born of a strong desire to share joy, feel energized, inspired, and fit on a daily basis. We'll hear from Kate about the self-trust tools that have transformed her life and how we can start putting these into practice and use our feminine power in the workplace. Some of the tools we'll hear from today are around mindfulness, self-care, the power of cyclic wisdom and meditation to name a few. I can't think of a better way than an International Woman Day for us to take stock of where we are at, where we want to be, and who do we need. So I'm talking about you, our male allies in the audience today, to, today, to get us where we want to be. So Kate, I'll now pass over the baton to you. Thanks, Claire. Hello, everybody, and welcome in. Um, that was a lovely introduction. My name is Kate Gaffey, as you know. Um, and my, my company is called Workplace Wellness. I'm just going to close out one of the boxes here. Um, so today we're celebrating International Women's Day. I want to wish any of you who are here with me or doing the recording a really happy International Women's Day. Um, I would love to just kick off by thanking everybody. And there's been a lot of you who's involved in bringing me in here today. And other than that, it's for you just to sit back, relax, let my words wash over you. Um, take what resonates, you can leave the, the rest. Uh, I will share a deck um, just for some of the things that we're discussing today. There's also some space for reflection. So as we work through some of the key points today, we'll be working through things like feminine leadership qualities, 
cyclic wisdom, self-trust, personal power, there's a space for you to reflect and and check in and ask yourself, well, where am I on this spectrum? Um, what can I learn? How do I feel? So you can journal on some of those questions. You can just think about them. You can let them ruminate over the coming days. And as the lady said there, as we kick off, your questions are also really welcome. So I have the webinar chat open here. If you want to type anything in, I'll keep an eye on it as we go. And we certainly have space for questions near the very end. Um, if you do have any technical questions on any of the stuff, some of them might be better left to the end, but feel free to type them in and I'll address them near the end unless they feel important. So I'm just trying to think, I think that's most of the administration out of the way. Um, in terms of what to expect today, we're going to kick off now. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background so that you can come to understand how I've come to a place where I'm speaking about feminine power and bringing it into the workplace. Um, we're going to speak about feminine leadership qualities. We're going to talk about cyclic wisdom and how it can allow us tap into embody and embrace our own feminine power and uh, we're going to talk about self-trust and that connection to our deep personal power i should say now at the very beginning when i say feminine power um or feminine leadership styles a lot of this is applying to women and men so our male allies who are here with us today on the call or doing the recording um i i don't want you to feel excluded i want you to know that when i'm talking about some of these qualities they apply to all of us the other piece and i'll get into it when we dive down the line a little bit when we talk about cyclic wisdom and um, some of that will apply to you as well so just keep an open mind i guess that's what i'm trying to say at this point uh so a little bit about me my name's kate gaffey i founded workplace wellness in 2014. <clears throat> before that um as claire said i worked in a daily stock brokers so i was very much in the corporate space it was very much a male dominated space and um, I was a good bit younger, but I've learned a lot by working there and also by leaving that environment. Um, and really what I learned is it's often what I see when I look back is that at that time, at that chapter in my life, in that environment, I didn't necessarily set myself up for success when it comes to my feminine power. I was going into a very male dominated arena. And my opinion or my feeling or how I operated at that time was that in order to succeed in what I viewed as a man's world, I needed to rise up and align with a very particular leadership style. So that includes being linear, being strategic, being logical, all great qualities. But I had shut down parts of me that might have included more empathy, more compassion, more intuition. So at that time in Davy. Again, like I said, it was a very hard linear logical time. I didn't respect a lot of the qualities that I held within when it comes to compassion and empathy. And I really wasn't bringing my full self to work. Um, it's no wonder then after a few years that I left and I went to set up my own business development consultancy, began integrating a little bit more of me. And then I really found the world of well-being. So starting with uh, yoga and movement practices, learning then into some things like mindfulness and meditation and then really branching out into areas like uh, menstruality and leadership and celtic wisdom and even some uh, shamanic practices and what's really funny is a lot of these different things were all saying the same thing um, or at least i interpreted them as all saying the same thing and what that is or was for me is that the structures that we are working in right now are capitalist society and um, corporate structures are predominantly, not always, but frequently only valuing one side of the coin. So 50% of what's there for us is left on the table. And by that, I mean, we're not valuing things like our feminine leadership skills we're not valuing half of the cycle and as you'll see as i go through some of the cyclic wisdom we can get stuck in one half of the spectrum so think about the example of the endless summer of always looking for output of always looking for results of always looking for um linear output productivity mode we're not necessarily making space for things like rest for going within for taking space and um, we'll explore just a little bit of that today. So as I 
really what I'm trying to say here is as I was diving into the world of well-being, as I was studying all of these different things, as I began to learn more about feminine leadership and menstruality, I began to see how much of ourselves, men and women, are leaving on the table and what the implication of that is in terms of how we feel, in terms of our well-being, how we show up in work and how we show up in relationship. So I'm going to show you a slide and I'm going to start screen sharing. Uh, and again, these screen share the slides will be available for you if you'd like to dive in at any point um this is our agenda for today but this is what i really want to talk about masculine and feminine leadership styles now before i dive into any of this it's really important for me to say these are just examples <laughs> this is not an exhaustive list and we're conditioned you know these words in some ways aren't very useful because we're conditioned to think masculine male feminine female these are human qualities we all possess them. And as I said, I believe that the corporate space is predominantly valuing one side of the coin more than the other. <clears throat> so if we're to talk through just a few of these, I want you to think about how you feel about each side of the spectrum, which side you lean into more. And maybe even if you want to, you can think about which side you value more. In the masculine strategic or leadership space, we're very much output focused. So we're looking at linear work, getting results, driving forward, always going for more, always driving on. The focus tends to be quite linear. Uh, we're valuing things like analytical mind, logic, competition, very results focused in a space of doing and not as much in the space of being. It's a very structured place. It can be quite individualistic and the focus tends to be on me. Again, I'm not saying that this is the way that men operate in the world. I'm not saying that this is a male way of doing things. I'm saying in terms of leadership styles, one half of the spectrum is certainly valued a lot more than the other half. So on the other side of this coin, we have what is deemed as or classed as or can be thought about the as feminine leadership qualities. And these are some of the qualities I would love to for International Women's Day with you just dive into a little bit more with the view of owning it, integrating it, respecting it and valuing these tools just as much as we value the other side. So it's not that we're going to throw everything on the left hand side out. It's really that I would love us to be coming to a place where we value things like our cyclic nature, where we value in the corporate space qualities like our intuition. Our intuition can actually come from really small, micro little things that are happening around us that we're perceiving that we don't even know. So making space for the analytical as well as the intuitive side. Um, where we're not ashamed to be or to get emotional in the corporate space, where we are remembering how important it is to collaborate with our colleagues and with our team, uh, where we are not just results oriented, but we are also focusing on the process, where we are making time for being as well as doing, where we value spaces where we can be in flow as well as structure, we're remembering just as we are now community and where we're working into a space of we. So some of these qualities, you know, I, I would just suggest in the in the feminine space, like intuition and emotional and even collaborative stuff can be seen of as weak. And we may, some of us men and women here on this call, be undervaluing these qualities in ourselves while we're overvaluing things like our linear, logical and analytical mind. What happens if we, and I think about these as two sides of the same coin, what happens if we're more on one side than the other is that we're out of balance. And so in my work with workplace wellness, with working with well-being with corporates and individuals, what I tend to see a lot of is burnout. I see a lot of people who are burnt out, who are stagnant, who are flat on one end of the spectrum, and on the other end, it's maybe who are frazzled or uninspired or depleted, not at their best, not bringing their best, not bringing their full selves or power to work. And some of the, the reason for that may be that we're not valuing the two sides of the coin. We're stuck in a results oriented place and we're forgetting about the joy and the results that we get along the process. Uh, we may be too struck, stuck in a rigid and structured environment and we're not also making space for a little bit of flow. 
Um, we may be really valuing, and this is a really big one, a linear uh, trajectory. So what do I mean by that? I mean that in general, our corporate spaces and our society in this, and I'm going to say capitalist patriarchal culture, <laughs> it's not an attack, it's just how we are. Um, but it's, we're in a linear mode, okay? So we are, for the most part, expected to turn up every day. We're expected to be pretty much the same. We're pretty much expected to be on an upward trajectory only. And when we finish one thing, generally it's on to the next. What you'll see, hopefully, in this presentation with me today as we dive into some of the cyclic stuff, is that by doing that, we're caught in one part of a cycle. We are not making space for rest and restoration for the most part. We're not making space a lot of the time for play and creativity. Some of the time we're not making space for review and renew. And we're caught mainly in one piece, which is do, 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 go, 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 output, output, output. What happens if we stay in that space is we're out of balance. We do over time get burnt out, depleted, frazzled, flat, stagnant, uninspired, or somewhere in that range. It's also worth mentioning on International Women's Day, and I'll dive into this a little bit in more detail later, that women, as we know, by our very nature are cyclic. In our reproductive years, women are going through a cyclic journey over the course of, uh, on average, 28 days. And that's largely ignored. We're not working in flow with those cycles either. So <clears throat> without, um, hopefully without banging the drum too much, I really just want to draw all of our attention to the place that is beginning to look at if we're more on one side than the other, if we view things like emotion in the workplace as a weakness, if we feel tapped into our own, for example, intuition, if we are remembering to value the process as well as the result, if we are working in harmony with the seasons of our lives, the seasons of our bodies. Um, and we can see this in the research. We can see, for example, when we look at things like DNI in the workplace, generally the bottom line improves. Um, even without getting into, uh, without opening a can of worms, things like our four day work week, and generally for a lot of companies, the results go up when people are rested and working better. Um, <clears throat> so again, really what I want to say here is some of these qualities are thought of as weak. Do you think of them as weak in yourself, perhaps? Many of us, because of the culture and the systems that we operate in, are cut off from one aspect of ourselves, and that leaves men in this equation as well. Um, and it means that we're leaving 50% on the table. And I want to suggest that if we make space to integrate the process as well as the results, to integrate time for flow as well as time for structure, to allow space for our emotions as well as our logic, that we are more well-rounded, that we live a life with more flow, more ease, more connection to ourself, to our inner wisdom, and that enhances what we're here to learn about and work with today, our personal power. So there are some points for reflection and you can, I'm gonna share in my next slide, but you can do these now if you wish in your head, you can pop them on paper or you can do them in your own time. Which side of this coin in your, you can think about your professional or your personal life, um, but which side are you operating from for the most part? Or do you feel that you're balanced between the two? <clears throat> and if you look at this list, are there any qualities that you would like to embody more? So for example, would you like to value your empathy in the corporate space more? Would you like to value your gut feeling and your intuition in the corporate space more? Would you like to create space for process or flow? Or maybe it's the other end of the spectrum. Maybe today, as we look at these leadership styles, you're somebody who's realizing that actually what you <clears throat> are failing to embody is the element of structure. Um, and then a really interesting question to ask yourself if you're making the time to dive into this is, what would change if you were to integrate them more? one of these qualities, the one that you're identifying here. So for example, if you have logic and structure and the linear method down to a fine art, if you're someone who sets goals, work towards them, achieves them and goes on to the next, <laughs> um, brilliant. But what would happen if you also made time for 
a space of rest? What would happen if you also made time to celebrate or to bookend a goal when you achieve it? What would happen if in your personal life, you also made time to go within, to reset, and then to come back out from a more whole or well or rested place? So a little bit of food for thought there. And again, you can keep any comments or questions in the chat box. So cyclic wisdom is something I really want to dive into. And <clears throat> this is probably for me one of the most beautiful and important parts of the well-being work that I share with individuals and corporates. Um, and I've hinted at some of this in, in, in the last frame when we're looking at them and leadership styles. But what I would love to say here is just to make the space now to acknowledge that our world actually operates in cycles. OK, so if you're in Ireland here, you can think about the seasons of the year. That's the biggest example of that. With that framework, we go through where we are now, for example, the time of spring where life is coming up slowly and gently. We go into summer full bloom where things are blossoming and thriving. We then move into autumn where the light starts to die, the leaves fall off the trees. And then we go into winter, which is a fallow period. It's like a fertile void where it looks like <clears throat> nothing is actually happening. But below the surface, what's happening is the regeneration that's needed for new life to come back. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can also see these cycles, for example, in something like the times of day and how you feel. So for the most part, most of us wake up in the morning, hopefully we're somewhat energized. We peak at energy at a particular point in the day. And then as the day goes on, and it gets closer to evening and nighttime, that energy drops off. So there is a natural cycle through the day. Um, we have, for example, the cycle of the moon, 28 day cycle where it waxes and wanes. Um, we have cycles, chapters and seasons in our life. So think about a season in your life where, for example, you're really busy and you've got a lot on your plate or how it feels when you're in a season in your life where you're in deep grief, your heart is absolutely broken and your reserves are very low uh, or a season of your life where you're starting a new job or a new relationship and you've got the promise of new beginning. I'm hammering it here, but what I want to stress and emphasize is that we as humans, men and women, by our nature are cyclic and that the world that we operate in and live in is by its very nature cyclic. Think of how different you feel at 8 a.m. versus 8 p.m. or in the depths of winter versus the depths of summer. Right now, the society that we're, op we're op operating in for the most part and the corporate world is by its very nature and design extremely linear. We are, for the most part, expected to turn up, to be the same every day, to come in the next day, be the same and go, go, go. There's not a lot of space for our natural ebb and flow when it comes to how we live, how we feel and what's happening in our bodies. And the reason for this is because no shade to any beautiful allies and men who are here today, but this system was set up for men by men, the system that we're working in a capitalist patriarchal society. I would argue that it's no longer serving men or women. Uh, if we look at the corporate structures, the nine to five, how we're all working and these systems that have been set up, they're initially set up when the men who were going to work and women were staying at home. Uh, men had women or wives for the most part who would take care of things like children, lunch, dinner, cooking and home. Society now is different. Women are in the workplace. Men and women are sharing the load. Men are doing school drop offs, cooking dinners, taking care of the household just as much as women are. But our structure hasn't changed. Again, we're expecting that linear focused output the whole time. So I would argue that we need to bring a level of awareness to our own inner cycles and seasons and how we're feeling and how we're doing and what we need so that we can begin to operate from a full place. Because what happens over time, if we stay in this linear model, this upward trajectory, go, 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 if there's no space for our own ebb and flow, if there's no space for periods of growth and then for a fallow time, we end up in that space of burnout, of exhaustion, of overwhelm, of depletion, or at the very least, just feeling flat, stagnant and uninspired. And that is not how we're supposed to live. So if I draw your attention here to this, uh, this is what I'm going to call a natural cycle of creation. OK, um, we have and you can think about this maybe in terms of the seasons, because it will be helpful for later. 
we have an initiate phase or a seed phase, or you can think about this in terms of spring. Then we move into what would be like a summer energy of growth or blossoming or driving on. Then we have a phase of completion or harvest. And then we have, and this is 100% the phase that's left out the most, of rest and restoration, that fallow period, that fertile void. So you could think about this in terms of, for example, agriculture. You could think about this in terms of what's happening in the seasons. You could think about this even in terms of the project. There's a place where you initiate and begin a project. There is a place where you grow and develop the project. There's a place where you complete and review. And then there should also be a space for stopping and resting so that when you begin that cycle again, you're ready to go. Uh, it also applies to, you can apply this to anything, like you could apply it to a relationship, for example, to a phase of your life, to a phase of the job. For the most part, our society is stuck in this kind of endless summer phase, productivity, output, turnout, um, movement forward all the time. We're not necessarily making space, we're almost in this endless summer energy, and again, this is what leaves us feeling it's really what I want to say is it's not sustainable being stuck in this in this summer. It's not sustainable for a planet in terms of longevity. It's not sustainable for ourselves in terms of longevity, how we feel. Um, and I want to share with you how this cycle of um, creation, I just see there's something in the chat box there, I'll keep an eye, thank you. <laughs> you can keep your comments coming in though. Um, the cycle of creation, interestingly, for International Women's Day, can you guess what I'm going to say, is mirrored in the female body. And it's so cool. Um, so not only can we work with these cycles and think about where we are when it comes to our relationships, our work projects, our health, uh, the seasons of our life, or even the time of day, we can actually use these when we look at the female body. Um, and I've got, I'm going to bamboozle you now with this slide. I thought I'd throw as many pictures up there as I can. <laughs> to confuse you. So the concepts here that I've just been outlining, if you look at the top left, you've got initiate, grow, complete and rest. That's like what I'm going to call the overall creative map that you can apply to anything. To the right of that, you have an outline of the female menstrual cycle. And I might just touch on that for a minute um, on the next slide so we can go more in depth. We have the circadian rhythm. That's your 24 hour cycle. Interestingly, by the way, in case you're not aware, the male physiological hormonal profile is a 24 hour profile. So men are on a 24 hour cycle. So again, it's no wonder that our structures and our corporate life is set up for this 24 hour cycle, because as I said, it was set up by men for men. Um, we have down on the bottom right, the points of the year that are also spiraling and cycling. So for example, from winter solstice to summer solstice, um, we have the seasons of the year and you can clearly feel a different energy from each of those seasons. And on the bottom left, there's one of my favorite graphics because on the outside of that are the cycles of the moon. And on the inside, you have the cycles of the womb. And interestingly, the lunar cycle and the menstrual cycle average length for the loop or for the menstrual cycle is 29.5 days, same as the female menstrual cycle. So you can make of that what you will. So without going into too much detail, I do want to touch on what's happening in a female body during reproductive years if you're having a natural menstrual cycle because you will either be managing somebody who's experiencing this, you'll be working with somebody who's experiencing this, you may have a wife or a daughter who's experiencing this, or you may experience this yourself. What's happening really briefly in the menstrual cycle is that we have something that's called the infradian rhythm. It is a 28, 29 day cycle. It goes for a whole month and it's largely ignored by our world. Can you imagine if we ignored the infradian rhythm? We are expected to go and be and feel and do the same every day when our bodies physiologically are completely different. In short, there's a menstrual phase where we shed the lining of our womb. There's a follicular phase as we build towards ovulation. There's ovulation, that's the main event of the menstrual cycle where our body releases an egg. And there's the luteal phase, which is where we're breaking back down um, towards menstruation, okay? and. That's as much as I'm going to say about that. You can think about these phases if you wish, if you want to understand them in your body or in someone else's a little bit more, just as you can think about seasons of the year. So if we actually start with winter, that's our menstrual phase. That's when we're bleeding. And if we think about the winter of the year, that's a time generally when we want to pull back, we want to go within, we want to 
uh, slow down and maybe we're a little bit less social. Our brain is also different due to our hormonal profile in each phase of the cycle. And we've got different strengths and weaknesses in each phase. Um, but that's a conversation for another day. After our menstrual phase, we move into spring, which is our follicular phase. As estrogen starts to rise, generally we get a little bit more energy. And just like spring and the season around us, new life is slowly starting to emerge. The key here is go slow. Uh, then we move into just pre and post ovulation, so our inner summer. And again, uh, this is the phase that most of us want to be in all the time. It's the output focused, it's a doing phase. We feel very, uh, what's the word? powerful, switched on, extroverted, ready to go. And it's the phase really, I'd argue that society wants the most from us, okay? And then we have the luteal phase or the autumn phase, which happens post ovulation as we come back down towards winter. And the luteal phase is a phase that's really misunderstood and a really challenging phase for a lot of women. We experience things like PMS and PMT. And um, if we think about the autumn as we look at the season, it's a really good way to understand this part or this chapter of the cycle. So after ovulation, you've just had a really big surge of estrogen and testosterone, and then all those hormones drop off. And then we're kind of almost going down a slippery slope towards menstruation. Uh, progesterone is the dominant hormone. And what tends to happen is our bodies are calling for more rest, for more space, for more, um, for doing a little bit less. But because we are in this linear structure, this linear society that values the inner summer kind of energy, we try to stay in that phase. And for a lot of us women who are in reproductive years, we end up feeling irritable, cranky, frustrated, exhausted and depleted because we're trying to stay in inner summer energy for the whole cycle. And so all I would really love to to get across with this, because I don't have a huge amount of time to talk about the menstrual cycle is that physiologically we are different every week and in fact every day of the menstrual cycle our hormones will have an impact on how our bodies feel and how our minds operate and our energy will be different in each phase if we try to imagine or feel like we're in one phase all the time if we try to stay in fifth gear all the time push 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 go 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 we will of course end up depleted tired cranky frazzled frustrated I'm here to advocate that part of your feminine power as a woman is tapping into and working with your menstrual cycle if you have one. And if you are here and you are a male ally or you're not cycling for any reason, you can also work with the seasons of the cycle. So here's a really confusing graphic and you don't need to understand this, but I've just popped it all on the one so that you can see these same kind of energies. In the menstrual cycle, we can map the different phases to different seasons, winter when you bleed, ovulation at the peak of summer. As I explained, or as I was trying to work with a little bit earlier here, as cyclic beings, our world is cyclic and we go from initiation to growth to completion to rest. Our society often doesn't make space for rest. It sometimes is really stuck somewhere between grow and complete, you know, we're harvesting all the time, we're in that endless summer. There's not always a whole lot of space for the creativity and the playfulness and the innovation of spring. There's certainly not place for the fertile void and the spaciousness of winter. And I'm here to argue that by giving yourself some extra inputs, whether it's a little bit more rest or a little bit more creativity or a little bit more flow or simply the permission to ebb and flow you will be tapping into and accessing a little bit more of your own innate power. Um, you will be breaking the pattern of burnout and exhaustion and overwhelm. You will be learning to work with your cyclic nature rather than against it. And for those who wish to, in some small way, you'll be rebelling against the capitalist patriarchal structures that uh, do a disservice to all of us men and women. And um, then at the very, very bottom here, we've got uh, tiny little model that's an interesting one that I sometimes use with my clients uh, and again I always start in the winter phase so they're slightly in the wrong order here but we've got dream play do review so you can think about this if you for those who are on a menstrual cycle you might have fun thinking about this in terms of your menstrual cycle the dreaming phase would be what you can do when you're bleeding a time for visioning for dreaming up for having the big ideas the play phase is a wonderful time when it comes to your inner spring 
So this is creativity, playfulness, experimentation, exploration, and you're holding a little bit of tenderness there. The inner summer, your ovulation, superwoman energy is a beautiful time for doing, for getting things done, for communication, for work like I'm doing today. Um, I'm unfortunately in my inner winter today, which makes it a little bit more challenging, but we make space. Um, and then we have the review phase, the harvest phase. And you can do that if you want to, for example, in your inner autumn. So at that point, the last week of your cycle, as you look back and think, what am I proud of this cycle? What worked? What didn't? What did I achieve? And uh, if you're not a menstruating person in your reproductive years, you can still use this framework. You can use it as you apply it to seasons of the year, or chapters of a project, or even seasons of your life, like how you feel right now. Um, so there's an interesting comment coming in, and I'm going to maybe come back for that just in a moment, um, just to let you know. So yeah, you can. this is a framework that's usable for projects, for relationships, for your self-care. So for example, whether you're perimenopausal, menopausal, in your reproductive years, uh, male and have never been cycling, or anywhere else on that spectrum, each of us today could ask ourselves, what season am I in today? Do I feel like I'm in the energy of winter, a little bit of a fallow time, a little bit of slowness? Do I feel the excitement and the bubbling energy of spring? Do I feel the full power of summer? Or do I feel that slowdown that happens at autumn? And once you identify the kind of phase, the kind of season that you're in, the most important thing is, what do I need? So as I go about into my day today, um, for example, me, I'm menstruating today. So even though I've got a booked out day of workshops and talks, what I need is just a little bit more slowness and to be really compassionate and kind to myself. I can still get my work done, I'm just aware of, of where I am and what I need. Um, same thing for your own self-care. Or for example, you find yourself in a season where you have experienced deep grief and deep loss in your life and you're feeling lost and cast out. You might, for example, know that you're in a winter phase. You're in like a fallow period. And what happens after that is in spring, new life slowly starts to come back. So it's just starting to work your self-care and your practices around this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so there's a, there's a question here, which I might park just near the end on perimenopausal and menopausal people whose hormones really fluctuate quite rapidly and wouldn't be as predictable as this tidy 28 day framework. So for, for, from my aspect, from the self-care and the wellbeing work that I do working with this, the first um, pit stop is the awareness. How am I like feeling? What do I have the capacity for? What do I need? And tailoring your work and your self-care slightly around that. Um, the other thing is starting to track. So you're starting to notice your own patterns and you can start to see how you are. And then what happens is people come to me and they say, well, look, I've got work to do. I've got clients, I've got deadlines. I can't just, you know, go in and, and say, Sorry, guys, I'm in my inner winter. I'm not available for work. Um, but it's about valuing yourself and where you're at enough to know what you need and then testing to see how could you give yourself even 1% of that. So the end result for everybody who's using this kind of model to check in is more compassion, more kindness, more empathy, the fundamental piece of self-care, putting yourself first, and the fundamental piece of personal power which is you end up coming to the world from a more full place. You end up coming from a place where you're not depleted, you're not frazzled, you're not uninspired, you're not stagnant or flat. And so really what I want to really hammer home is no matter whether you're cycling or not, I feel as a well-being expert, I'll call myself, <laughs> uh, that we are living in a society that prioritizes doing, output, pushing, striving and moving forward we know that's not sustainable for the planet and we see that's not sustainable generally when it comes to things like burnout and stress in the workplace we can when we just simply attune to a model or a framework similar to this cyclic model begin to understand that there's a natural life cycle behind everything there's a time for play and innovation there's a time for doing and achieving there's a time for rest harvest review and there's a time for restoration and complete rest. And we can begin then to work with them a little bit more. And some questions again, that I have for you today, and I'd love if there's anybody here who um, 
Another great question coming in, which I'll say for the end. Um, if there's anybody here who's who's intrigued by this, or maybe you give yourself 10 minutes after this workshop or tonight to answer these questions, but to deeply answer, like, how would or would your life change if you gave yourself permission to embrace your cyclic nature? That means if you, for example, have a sick parent and a sick child and um, have just sold your house or something, can you give yourself permission to be different now than you would have been a year ago when you had none of those things going on? It's not to say we don't bring the best of ourselves to work or home. It's that we do the game a little different. We dance it a little bit different. We're not so hard on ourselves. We're not stuck in one gear. We actually have a choice of different gears to use for ourselves depending on the time. So your reflection now, if you want to, if you're willing to, is would or how would life change if you embraced this nature a little bit more, particularly for those women who are menstruating, perimenopausal or even menopausal or on that roller coaster? How would life change if you worked in harmony with it instead of against it? And also an interesting question is, well, what season would you like to cultivate more of in your life and why? So for a lot of people, you know, I can answer this for you. We need more of the winter energy. <laughs> we need more uh, stillness, slowness, going within, rest, restoration. Uh, we need to trust in the space of the fertile void. Um, but for you, maybe you feel you've been in that space loads and you'd like more summer, more output, more focus, more driving forward. Or maybe you're starting to realize, oh, you know, I've got the review kind of area sorted, but the, I'm not making space for innovation and play. That would be a spring kind of energy. So just to ask yourself, and there's no right or wrong answer here with any of this, what season am I, am I in? And how could I embrace this more? And so I hope that you can see how two things we've talked about so far today, leadership qualities and how we tend to be skewed towards one side and our cyclic nature and how we tend to be encouraged to be in one season. I hope you can see that by embracing all of your qualities, the linear and the cyclic, um, the structure and the flow, you get to bring more to the table, not less. It's not weak to be emotional as well as focus you can be both <laughs> and i hope that you can see or maybe you'll open to the idea that instead of trying to be the same every day and hustle and push and grind you can make space for the ebb and flow it doesn't mean you're going to drop the ball on everything it means you're working with your energy and with whatever cycle or season you're in rather than against it and all of this comes to what i'm, I'm talking to you about today i hope which is cultivating a deep sense of self-trust. There are a lot of ways of building confidence. There are a lot of ways of building power, and there's a lot of different schools of thought on this. My thought on this is that when we, okay, here's, a, here's a big thought. <laughs> Society has conditioned us to look outside of ourselves rather than inside of ourselves for affirmation. That puts the power in somebody else's hands. Women particularly, but every one of us are very hard on ourselves and then society tends to be hard on ourselves again. When we learn to source our power from within, when we learn to trust our inner voice, our inner wisdom, we're cultivating and building self-trust. And by doing that, we're cultivating and building our personal power. So when we make the break from this society that somehow is set up to have us look outside of ourselves. Like think about beauty standards. Think about the pressure that's on mothers to be a particular way. When we park that and we start to come back to ourselves, we start to listen to our bodies. We start to listen to our wisdom. We start to listen to our voice. Then we're really building that self-trust. Then we can give to the world from a more full place. Then we can step into more of our own authentic selves. And the well-being world, which I am a part of, will have you believe that somebody outside of you has the answers. <laughs> we don't. You have the answers. And so this sense of self-trust, which is going to cultivate your personal power, I hope, is all about making the space and time to listen to your wisdom and intuition, learning to value it, whether that's your cycle or your innate powers that you already have, or the parts of you that maybe you've castrated as weak, bringing them back online learning to identify your own gifts and to use them and leaning in to these cycles and letting it them resource you rather than leaning away from them and seeing them as a curse, seeing them as a problem. 
developing our self-trust cultivates a deeper relationship with ourself. It cultivates an unshakable sense of confidence because it's coming from you, not from somebody else. Nobody can take that framework or that sense away. And so it's your reminder, and we all know this, but it is your reminder to start listening to your body's wisdom, to start learning from it, to start valuing it. And in fact, I would argue if we were really doing that, there wouldn't be jobs for people like me reminding us all about cycles, reminding us all about seasons, because we would know. We would know I'm in a really tough place right now. I need to pull back a little bit. We would know I have produced, 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 produced. It's okay for me now just to trust that I can pull back slightly and that when my creativity comes next, it's going to be even more powerful. All that this self-care that I'm teaching you today or that I'm sharing with you today does is make you more potent and powerful rather than trying to be linear push 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 all the time and be average all the time and maybe work towards burnout we're actually working with our natural ebb and flow we're working with our wisdom we're engaged in a dance with ourselves and with our bodies and with our inner knowing and that's powering us up to bring more of ourselves to the world um, so again your questions your homework for any hopefully there's a few nerds who might do these is to ask yourself how sorry to call you nerds that was a joke um how can you practice self-trust more for you because it's going to be different for each of us and a really beautiful question to ask yourself in the context of your work or or your life is i if, if i really backed myself if i really believed if i really trusted in my power what would change um and before we move towards the q a I made a little power equation. This is how I think about power. <laughs> how you think about power might be entirely different. Um, and you, you may or may not know, there's, there's loads of schools of thought on power, but there's one that says that there's four different kinds of power. So there's power over, power over people. There's power with, power with others. There's power in, in terms of the power from institutions and community. And there's power within, which is like personal power, which is what we're kind of working with today. Um, and I really view it as the ability to shape the life you want, to make the change you want, and to be who you are in the world. And so for me today, with the work that we're doing together with this piece of self-trust, of feminine power, of cyclic wisdom, power for me is bringing more of our authentic selves to the world, and it's sourced from within, so nobody can take that away. And then full power <laughs> is this place where we're offering our gifts to the world from a place of alignment with our true selves and from a full place. So again, it's this message of not depleted, not frazzled, not tired. Imagine how radical, and I'll say women today because it's International Women's, today, Women's Day today, but like rested, radiant, alive, vital women are. Imagine how much more powerful they are than depleted, frazzled, tired women who are struggling to keep up. The world needs more rested, revitalized, radiant, powerful women, not more frazzled, wrecked, tired um, women who are working off somebody else's obligation. And the world also needs the men who support that and the men who, who support that in themselves as well. The world needs all of us offering our gifts to the world from a full place. Uh, and the last little equation, I would love to say for you today, or food for thought perhaps, is that embracing for women and men our unique cyclic nature and by cultivating a deep sense of self-trust that nobody can take from you. We're accessing wisdom. We're going to be well rested. We're going to be more radiant. We're going to be alive. We're going to be thriving and we're going to be ready to offer our gifts to the world. I hope there's my prayer. <laughs> So I will give you your other little bit of homework. And again, these slides will be circulated to anybody who would like them afterwards. Is what leadership quality would you like to embrace in 2023? So if you were to be brave, like, do you want the strategic, logic, linear? Maybe that's the work that you actually need. Or would you like to experiment with bringing more of your, let's say, your intuition or your feminine magic in your work as well as the others? And then a really interesting question to ask yourself is, 
how could you bring more of your personal power to the workplace? And to simplify that, I want to say, how could you bring more of yourself, more you? What would that look like? And then finally, um, and I love this question for us, is what energy would you like more of in 2023? So if you were to let everything I spoke about today go, and you were to think about your year ahead and your personal and professional, what are you calling in? Who do you want to be? How do you want to feel? And maybe today, if you only do one piece of work or of homework with me, it will be to decide for yourself what's the energy. So that if we all meet International Women's Day 2024, you can come back and say, Kate, I embrace power, or I embraced emotion, or I embraced bolshiness, or I embraced rest, <laughs> or whatever it is that it's going to be for you if you choose something and then embody it. Um, magic happens so i think that's it from me and um, just yeah that's it thank you so much everybody i'm going to stop the screen share and um we do have some questions coming in so i can address them i'll let you uh work it with me francesca hey thank you so much just wow i think <laughs> is my first response uh so refreshing so honest um in all the, the the content that you shared with us very motivating i have to say i speak for myself but hopefully for others in that as well um it just there was so much i was writing down forgetting that of course kate is going to share her her slides with us um after fact when when you get a copy of the recording but um yeah some things that really resonated were even just that piece around that the the linear systems are no longer working for men or women you know that you, that you spoke on and really that piece of um the value being placed on these more cyclical qualities and i think that value piece is really 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 important and it's funny even as you went through just the four phases of the cycle it just you know really occurred to me you know as adults um, and and maybe in an education system that was maybe a bit more lacking in terms of education around these type of things we don't get an opportunity to have the phases explained out to us particularly maybe the males in the audience as well so i just think that's you know for myself even that's been really beneficial and i just really enjoyed the content throughout i'm conscious of time and i've seen some brilliant questions coming in there so i mean yeah we might just jump straight straight in if that's okay and yeah, um, ready so the first, yeah, so the first one was around, and um, while I agree with the cyclical nature of women's menstrual cycle, um, what about the large number of women in their 40s onwards who are in perimenopause or menopause where hormones can fluctuate widely and are extremely unpredictable? So I know you had touched on that briefly, but yeah, you might have so, more to add. Um, yeah, the first piece, and you touched on it as well, Francesca, the first piece is valuing. So we are trained to devalue these women's experiences of menopause, uh, which is actually where women are coming into their power the most, they've got the most wisdom and of perimenopause, which thankfully people are only beginning to talk about now, and of our cycles. So number one for every person, if you're experiencing this, is to value where you're at, the wisdom you get and the gifts that you get from these things. Number two, um, tracking. So you can track even a word, a, the day that you're on and the word for how you feel every day. So that over time you start to see a pattern. Again, this will be a whole workshop. But in short, you can begin tracking, you can start to look for how you feel, and then you may or may not spot a pattern in all of that chaos that you've mentioned, which will be slightly different or maybe similar to the cyclic framework I gave. And at the very least, even if you don't spot a pattern by checking in and by tracking, what starts to happen is you notice how you feel. You wouldn't believe the amount of people I work with you actually don't even know. And by noticing how you feel, you can hopefully meet yourself with more compassion, more empathy, more understanding, and you can flow through the world with more grace and ease. So value where you are. Don't let society diminish it. Track if you can, see if you spot patterns, and then meet yourself with the compassion and empathy and kindness that allows you to flow with more grace and ease would be um, my summary for that one love that Kate and actually just as you mentioned there it might be a good time to just mention you know a lot of your own content does cover some of these topics and even oh, if yeah. people do want to you know get in touch with yourself it might just before we skip on it might just be a good you know chance to yeah, to call that absolutely. out as well yeah and you know a pitch for business here as well is that I spend my time delivering educational workshops on just the menstrual cycle for women and men or working with it or programs for women who want to dive deeper into this 
I share some of that stuff on my own Instagram. I share it in the corporate space. And there are actually, there's a lot of people in the world right now, it may not seem like it, but doing this kind of stuff, it, it's on the rise, believe it or not. So yeah, there's education everywhere for you. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, I will pop us on then to, uh, what do you think are the effects on an organization that has no menstruating persons in leadership positions? So that's one for you. Oh, it's tough. Um, this is the way of the world that we're in right now, a lot of the time. I think if there are no menstruating persons in leadership, it's obviously really, really difficult to have this conversation. Okay, so for the most part, it's largely ignored and dismissed. That said, and I just said this in the workshop I've come from because it was a construction company and it was women that came and they were like, no way can I talk to the men about this. We as women need to own this. <clears throat> we need to offer it reverence and respect in ourselves. We need to understand it in ourselves and then we can bring it out. I have yet to have had a conversation with a man where I give the seasons or the framework where that hasn't been received well, you know, so <clears throat> I think that unfortunately in those organizations that have all men in senior leadership and nobody's talking about it, there is an impact, it will be largely ignored. What can we do? We start to understand and educate ourselves, we start to respect and value it in ourselves, and we hopefully can start a conversation where we put our hand up and say, hey, would you ever think about this and get it in the door that way? But there's certainly like, we just need to look at the world. Like most people flinch when you say period, menstrual cycle, or I'm bleeding. There's a, for women and men, you know? So there's a lot of work to be done and we can start very slowly, um, but change needs to happen. So um, hopefully by conversations like this, we can just begin that process. Yeah, it's just starting that conversation. I suppose having the confidence to do so, um, you know, is a big piece. Yeah. And then we have another question. Um, so, hi, this has been a great session. I feel if I give myself permission to rest and relax, a part of me says that I'm allowing myself to be weak and therefore I push myself to keep going no matter what. How do I overcome that feeling? Uh, the answer is in the question. <laughs> so there's a word I always use with people, which is permission. Just put that in capital letters for yourself. Permission, permission, permission. You need to give yourself permission because our society doesn't give it to us, unfortunately. Society has a productivity mindset. We need to earn our rest. We need to earn our calories. We don't. We're human beings. We deserve to be well rested, alive, radiant, vital, full of life and offering our gifts from that place. So it is a radical act, but it is possible to begin offering ourselves permission, permission to notice the ebbs and flows permission to work with the ebbs and flows, permission to take rest. And with permission, what has to come is a sense of deep trust. So trust in yourself that you have the capacity to work when you need to work, trust in yourself that you can hear your body's signals and respect them, and trust in the process that after a time of rest, just like winter, comes spring and summer, that these fallow periods, this fertile void, this space of rest and restoration actually gives us more so permission to do it trust in yourself that it's possible to to do it and to come out of it and trust in the greater cycle that your rest only makes you more powerful your rest only gives you more I I so much case. I could keep going all day but i, I, won't. I know I and we <laughs> we could keep listening all day too um I, i'm very conscious of time but claire had you anything further that you wanted to um any further questions from your end or anything like that that you wanted to contribute yeah there was this one that we had here that um a couple of people had discussed with me before this when i was sitting tell everybody was we had kate coming on today and um, so it is I love the whole idea about it is giving ourselves permission and it, it is about taking those baby steps because it's not going to be a switch of a light bulb here. Um, so how do we start that process of, you know, learning to listen to it from within and, you know, is it a case of you know, we say we're going to we're going to start self meditating and we're going to start journaling tomorrow or, you know, how, how do we take those steps um, mm. Kate? It's a great question. You know, um, for each of us, it's going to, I think, look different. So look, I love journaling, love meditation, love a bit of yoga, all of that. I think giving ourselves that permission to turn inwards, uh, seeking education. So it could be from somebody like me or another teacher that you know, um, seeking experiences that bring you back to yourself. 
could be time in nature. It could be a cold dip. It could be your journal prompts. It could be a revitalizing yoga nidra. Finding things that help you tune in. And then if it's something that's really new for you, like in the case of meditation, for example, you're brand new, you might close your eyes and go like, oh, whoa. Like starting really slow and really small. And it's like anything, it's a process. It's one step at a time. It's one foot at a time. It's one piece at a time until suddenly you're aware of the smallest fluctuations in your inner landscape and you're attuned to that in every you know element of your life. So starting slow, having some fun, having a playful exploration, getting help along the way. And really it's a mindset piece as well because we need to acknowledge and understand the structures that are around us aren't necessarily driving us towards that. It's that piece of seeking outward that piece of not good enough. It's also, it's easy to sell people things when they feel like they're not good enough. It's really much harder to do it when they're coming from a full place. So society's conditioned us to look out, not in. So um, to make your peace with that and, and, and to be kind to yourself as you do it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Kate. And sorry, everyone, for going a little over time, but I think it was definitely worthwhile even to just get those last nuggets of wisdom in as well. <laughs> Um, Kate, it was really wonderful. Thanks so much for being here with us. Thank you to Claire as well. Thank you to Chris in the background that makes all of these webinars possible. And thank you to all for joining us and go forward and enjoy your International Women's Day, everyone, and take care. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.